The history of mazes and labyrinths is as lengthy and elusive as their twisting paths suggest. More than pleasant pastimes, or scientific oddities where finding the hidden goal is the ultimate objective. Mazes of all sizes intrigue and delight us, feeding our desire to create order out of confusion. But their origin, dating back at least as far as recorded history, reveals a much deeper symbolism, spanning a multitude of cultures and tapping into the very essence of ourselves. Mazes and labyrinths were used as ceremonial pathways representing birth, death, the path of the planets and stars through the cosmos, God, a metaphor for the journey through life and our search for ourselves. One of history's most famous mazes comes from ancient Greek mythology. Minos, king of Crete, son of Zeus, ordered Daedalus, his great architect and inventor, to construct a huge maze from which escape would be impossible. Within this labyrinth, the king placed the horrible Minotaur, a monster half man and half bull that lived on human flesh. The king would regularly feed the beast seven youths and seven maidens from the nearby city of Athens, casting them into the labyrinth. Theseus, a brave lad from Athens, volunteered to sail to Crete and slay the Minotaur. Just before entering the mammoth lair, the king's daughter, Adrian, gave him a ball of golden thread. By letting the thread out behind him as he went, he could, after slaying the beast, find his way out of the maze by retracing his steps. The plan worked. The Minotaur was killed, and Theseus and Adrian escaped together in his ship. This, of course, is ancient Greek mythology. But ruins uncovered at Knossos on the island of Crete suggest the basis for the myth. The 4,000-year-old site, partially reconstructed by Sir Arthur Evans at the turn of the century, reveals labyrinthine ruins of an ancient palace, extensive convoluted interiors with many doors, and chambers with ornamental columns. This was believed to be the palace of King Minos and the home of the Minotaur. Here sat the king himself, on the oldest throne in all of Europe, ruling over the Minoan civilization and the surrounding seas with the first organized naval fleet in recorded history. Wall frescoes in the palace depict the ancient Minoan sport of bull jumping, possibly the basis for the legend of men battling a fierce monster that was part bull. The double horns of the bull were symbolized by the Minoan labrys, a ceremonial double-headed axe from which the labyrinth got its name. The palace of Knossos was eventually destroyed in 1450 BC. Another theory to the actual location of the Cretan labyrinth was that the extensive network of natural caves near Gortina on the south side of Crete might have served as the labyrinth of the Minotaur recreated here by the underground grotto at Leeds Castle in England. Ironically, one of the 17th century explorers of the caves, C.R. Cockrell, assured his escape by unwinding a length of string behind him. He later wrote in his journal, the clearly intentional intricacy and apparently endless number of galleries impressed me with a sense of horror and fascination which I cannot describe. At every 10 steps, one was arrested and had to turn to right or left, sometimes to choose one of three or four roads. What if one should lose the clue? More important than whether the labyrinth of the Minotaur actually existed is the design that represents it. Today, known as the Cretan or classical labyrinth design. It consists of seven rings of paths, shown here as the light areas, contained within eight concentric walls, the dark areas. Like all labyrinths, it is unicursal, meaning one path, without junctions or choices of any kind. It is used as a simple way to capture the essence of the maze. This archetypal design has existed for over 4,000 years, from engravings found in Greece and Italy to rock carvings. This petroglyph is at Tintagel, near the supposed birthplace of King Arthur. Legend has it that Merlin, the king's great magician, would banish his enemies into exitless labyrinths. This rock carving was found in Acera, Spain, 
and dates from the late Iron Age, some 2,000 years ago. While this example, the oldest on the British Isles, was found in Ireland and dates back to 500 AD. The design also appears as wall art and drawings, such as this example found in a cave in Surrey, England, and this version from Denmark, which expands the number of rings. In addition to adding rings, the labyrinth design was often portrayed as square rather than round, as on the design on coins from ancient Crete, the mythological home of the Minotaur. Cretan coins had both circular and square classical labyrinth designs. This design has flourished around the world for two reasons. First, its simplicity to render. The design is created by starting with a cross and four dots. The dots are then joined to the ends of the cross with arcing lines, always producing an exact copy of the classical labyrinth. This simplicity has allowed the design to be carried through time and across cultures virtually unchanged for thousands of years. Secondly, the design has survived because it has applications to basic concepts throughout the world, most notably the journey through life to death and other sacred rites of passage. Stone-lined labyrinths flourished by the hundreds in the Scandinavian countries of Norse civilizations. Before leaving for months at sea, sailors would walk to the center of the path, then turn and quickly run out leaving bewildered evil spirits and bad weather lost in the twists and turns behind them, ensuring them a good voyage to sea. Often called Troy towns or walls of Troy, they were named after Homer's famous city of Troy that remained protected from siege safely within impregnable walls. An adaptation of stone labyrinths the multi-ring labyrinth design cut into turf surfaced as a ceremonial pathway in predominantly European countries. This turf maze at Dalby in England is the smallest surviving turf maze in Europe. Both Dalby and this larger example in Hanover, Germany have been preserved from ancient times. Again, additional rings were often added to the classic design. This turf maze at Somerton has 15 rings. As Christianity took hold, labyrinths attained religious acceptance, the cross in the center making the pagan design more acceptable. This example, from St. Regna's Church in Ireland, accentuates the cross at the center of the classical labyrinth design. Turf mazes sprang up around churches. The design adapted slightly from the seven concentric circles to this medieval Christian design, a cruciform path moving freely through the four quadrants and often adding more rings, much like was done with the classical labyrinth design. The Hilton turf maze, preserved since the Middle Ages, has nine rings. While the ancient turf maze in the village of Wing has 11 rings. Overlooking River Trent and the Umber Estuary sits the Christian turf maze Julian's Bower, also with 11 rings. It has been maintained since 1200 AD. Annual use and recuttings have caused this and many of the other turf labyrinths to become sunken. The largest surviving turf maze in the world is the 15 ring labyrinth at Saffron Walden. 132 feet across, its path is just under a mile long. The ash tree in the center burned down during Guy Fawkes celebrations in 1823. Featuring a cloverleaf design, the maze was first mentioned in village documents in the 15th century noting that young men of the district would meet here and challenge each other to running the maze in record time to reach the young maiden waiting in the center. This has obvious parallels to courting rituals, with the imagery suggesting the journey of conception. Maze running was a symbol of the fertility of the earth, and turf mazes became a common sight at medieval fairs and May Day festivities. Sadly, because of lack of upkeep, only a handful of these delicate turf mazes survive today. Shakespeare wrote in A Midsummer Night's Dream, the quaint mazes in the wanton green for lack of tread are indistinguishable. It is truly incredible that such fragile artifacts, many from ancient times, have been preserved to present day, a tribute to their importance in surrounding cultures. Soon, church mazes progressed from the commons to the church itself, Often on the threshold, as at the Altborough Parish, 
worshippers would cross over the pattern knowing that the curiosity of the devil would lure him into the winding pattern, trapping him there and allowing the parishioner to enter the church and worship. At Watts Chapel, the distinctive design watches over parishioners from above and is also engraved on the ornate altar within. The design came to represent the difficult path to heaven only by selecting the righteous path and avoiding the turns of temptation offered by the devil could one truly find life after death. Inside churches, near the end of the 12th century, monks would slowly transverse the meandering paths, sometimes on their knees, as a substitute for the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, hence the name Road to Jerusalem, as this labyrinth at Eli Cathedral is called. Worshippers would often walk a maze as penance and to meditate, or to ward off evil spirits, who some believed could only travel in straight lines. This maze is at the small parish of Bath Easton. At St. Mary Redcliffe's Church in Bristol, there exists one of the smallest labyrinths, but also one of the most beautiful. Built during the 13th century, one of the 1,200 roof bosses in the church is a small medieval Christian labyrinth. The Bristol water maze in Victoria Park is a brick channel through which water flows. Its 11-ring circuit is an exact copy of the roof boss at St. Mary's. In deference, one axis of the maze points directly towards the spire of the church a mile away. Today the quest continues. At Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, a replica of the original labyrinth at Chartres Cathedral in France is used for modern-day meditation. People from all walks of life, within and without the church, use the journey for personal introspection. The labyrinth has surfaced in many cultures around the world throughout history. The Egyptians, under the rule of Pharaoh Amenemhat III, created the first structure to actually be called a labyrinth, some 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. With 3,000 interconnecting rooms on two levels, the giant labyrinth was to be used as a burial crypt and was built in the shadow of the Great Pyramids. Unfortunately, the structure did not survive to present day. But the Greek traveler and father of history, Herodotus, visited the site and declared the great Egyptian labyrinth even greater than words can tell, more spectacular than even the Great Pyramids. The Roman Empire used it as an ornamental design, often rendered in mosaic, methodically filling one quadrant at a time with the meandering path. The Romans also used the design in architecture. Interestingly, when the Roman meander design is fanned out into a circle, it is shown to actually be a compressed version of the familiar classical labyrinth design. In France, during the 16th century, this design was worn as an emblem to signify important people. The accompanying motto was, the fates will find a way. The Grand Canyon of the American Southwest is believed to be the spiritual source of the Hopi people and their place of emergence into this world. Nearby, at the Hopi Reservation of Arabi, this seven-ring classical labyrinth has been preserved. It symbolizes the womb of Mother Earth and the spiritual rebirth from one world to the next. At the now deserted Hohokam Indian ruins in Arizona stands the ancient four-story tall Casa Grande Observatory, built and used by the Indians to observe the cosmos. Within the innermost chamber, this 800-year-old petroglyph survives. Based on the classical labyrinth design, it symbolizes the movements of the planets and the stars through the heavens. Today, the design has developed into what the Indians call the House of Iatoi, or the Man in the Maze. It is used in the ceremonial artwork, silver craft, and exquisite basketry of the Tohono O'odham Indians, and symbolizes individual and tribal rebirth. Legend has it that their savior, Iatoi, or elder brother, traveled along the twists and turns on the path of life, acquiring knowledge and insight. He eventually approached death at the center of the labyrinth, but ultimately averted death with the final turn of the path. He traveled instead to the spirit world.
From there, he reflected back on his journey, having achieved eternal life. 300 miles away in the California desert is another series of very old Indian petroglyphs. One example, the Hemet Maze Stone, like several of the neighboring examples, has the meandering path within a large square shape, paying homage to the four sacred forces of nature, earth, water, fire, and air. Ancient labyrinths in China were used as time-telling devices. This design, used during the Tang Dynasty, used burning incense in the grooves of this labyrinthine pattern to accurately mark the passage of 100 days. People of the Shipibo tribe of the Amazonian rainforest in Peru use mazes and labyrinthine patterns to depict life. For over a thousand years, these designs have been painted on artwork, pottery, clothing, even on the body and faces of the Indians themselves. The people of Malakula, an island near Australia and New Zealand, consider their hand-drawn sand labyrinths maps of the underworld, symbolic of death. Without the map, souls could lose their way to the afterlife. In Africa, mazes take on a very practical application. Entire Ovambo villages are laid out as mazes to confuse attacking enemy tribes. The stick walls are movable so that the maze can be changed from time to time. In Celtic countries, the three-dimensional labyrinth designs of the Celtic knot symbolize continuity of life and the path of fate. They were sometimes used as guides for winding maze dances. Leonardo da Vinci was also known to create knot labyrinths called concatenations. In Europe, the Middle Ages gave way to the Renaissance, and the single-pathed or unicursal labyrinth gave way to the multicursal maze, having many paths. With more leisure time, mazes and labyrinths were becoming more ornamental rather than spiritual. Knot gardens with their small garden mazes made of box hedges only a few inches high became a common sight. They were usually placed just below upper story windows so that their interesting patterns could be viewed and appreciated from above as an allegory of the perplexities and intricacies which beset life. Plans for garden mazes were published in books throughout the 14th century. These first mazes had no actual false pathways, deception, or dead ends. They were meant solely for leisurely enjoyment, many adding ornamental statues and fountains along the paths. Quickly, though, it was discovered that if you incorporated wider pathways into the garden, one could actually get inside the maze and experience it firsthand. Eventually, garden shrubbery became garden hedges, and the participants could no longer see the layout of the maze from without. They had to enter the secret confines of the maze. False turns and blind alleyways were added to the multicursal pathways. The hedge maze had arrived. Hampton Court in Surrey, England, is home to one of the oldest surviving hedge mazes and surely the world's most famous. Planted in 1690 by George London and Henry Wise for Sir William of Orange, it was almost torn down by the royal gardener, Lancelot Capability Brown, who had a room overlooking the maze and who felt that bending nature to man's folly was wrong. A champion of natural landscaping, Capability Brown destroyed hundreds of fine hedge mazes during his time, but King George III gave him specific orders not to touch his maze at Hampton Court, and so it remains one of the few to survive. To this day, tens of thousands of guests a year plunge into the twisting half-mile of corridors to experience the thrill of being lost. It was soon found that this type of maze could be solved by the hand-on-wall rule. If you place your hand on the hedge on either side of the path upon entering and follow it in and back out of the dead ends, you will eventually arrive at the goal. This is because the maze's entrance is attached to its goal by one very long continuous hedge. Put another way, the maze has just one true path with numerous dead ends leading off of it. The much larger hedge maze at Aberdeen in Scotland is actually the same type of maze and therefore still solvable using the simple hand-on-wall method. Even though the Aberdeen maze appears very complicated, the hand-on-wall rule will work because the entrance and the goal are connected by the same hedge.
It will also work in the Glendurgan maze, planted in 1833, which utilizes a unique free-form design with no right angles, making it very easy to get turned around and literally walk in circles. The third Earl of Stanhope overcame the hand-on-wall solution with his hedge maze at Chevening in Kent. Built in 1820, it was created out of separate but interlaced hedges between the entrance and the goal, each individual hedge shown here in a different color. Using the hand-on-wall method in a maze of this sort would simply return you to the entrance of the maze. Maze puzzle books contain other psychological design innovations that add to the confusion. You can be sure that given a choice, the path that appears to approach the goal is actually a dead end. Also, more correct path choices involve left-hand turns, because most people, being right-handed, will more often choose the path to the right, the wrong path. Mazes are problems in topology, the science of how things are connected. Some feel that one is never truly inside a maze, but merely traveling through it. Today, mazes are experiencing a rebirth of interest, with new ones being created in many different forms. The recent pavement maze at Kentwall Hall was created to celebrate 500 years since the start of the Tudor dynasty in 1485. The Tudor Rose Pavement Maze, with a chessboard at its center, is 70 feet across and is made of over 27,000 bricks. You must find your way from the front door of the manor to the gardens, following brick paths that include regular intersections and designs indicating bridges and underpasses. At beautiful Leeds Castle, beyond the Culpeper Gardens and the aviary, a newly created maze draws guests ever inward. Mazes and labyrinths incorporate designs which can be appreciated from without and from within. They lure you in to participate. Like life, you never know where a maze will take you or how long it will take to get there. It doesn't matter which way you go, said the Cheshire Cat in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. You're sure to get somewhere if you only walk long enough. At Leeds Castle, that somewhere is a surprise ending. A descent into an underground grotto, complete with waterfall, by which the final escape is made. At Longleat, the Marquess of Bath recently built the world's largest hedge maze. The maze is larger than a football field, with over one and a half miles of pathways, including bridges and underpasses. It can take hours to solve, and its unusual spiral junctions leave visitors asking that eerie question, haven't I passed this way before? The head groundskeeper trims the hedges once a year, pointing out that the cutting isn't the hard part. What is most difficult is packing all the trimmings back out through the maze by hand. Today, human-sized, changeable mazes are springing up around the world, popular from New Zealand and Australia to Japan and the United States. Easy to construct, and even easier to change when the path becomes too familiar, these designs harken back to the changeable tribal village mazes of the Avambos in Africa. Unlike the leisurely strolls through garden and hedge mazes, these modern mazes encourage speed by timing your journey. Solving the puzzle as quickly as possible is part of the challenge. In today's mad rush to get from one place to the next as quickly as possible, mazes remind us that the shortest distance between two points isn't always a straight line. The modern age has spawned countless tabletop variations of the labyrinth and maze, inviting us to enjoy the journey as we travel the twisting, convoluted pathways. Because as in life, we really don't know where we might end up. The computer age, with its labyrinthine circuit boards and computer chips, has given us interactive maze challenges to conquer. Writer, sculptor, and maze designer Michael Ireton died in 1975 and is buried in Hadstock Churchyard in England. A bronze replica of one of his maze designs appears on his gravestone. The much larger original he built out of brick for banker Armand Earp in New York State. The walls are eight feet tall and increase in height as one approaches the goals. 
Two of Ireton's finest bronzes are situated as double goals within the maze. One is of the Minotaur, seven feet tall, and poised in anger to attack any who may innocently wander into his lair. The other sculpture, located in the second goal, is impressionistic and is of Daedalus, the inventor of the Cretan labyrinth where the Minotaur was imprisoned. With Daedalus is his son, Icarus, who stands on his father's shoulders, leaping towards the sky to fly upwards with wings of feathers and wax made by his father. Ultimately, Icarus flew too close to the sun, melting his wings and hurling him back to earth to his death. Ayrton wrote that each man's life is a labyrinth, at the center of which is his death. It is a paradox of the labyrinth that its center appears to be the way to freedom. In a maze, time crosses and recrosses, and one time lives in another. Throughout history and cultures, mazes and labyrinths have been closely related, even synonymous. Yet, they are very different in nature. While you might lose yourself in a maze, you can find yourself in a labyrinth. Walking a labyrinth with its unicursal path puts one in touch with age-old rhythms and oneself. Mazes and labyrinths compel the observer to enter and to travel the winding paths and explore what one finds hidden there, to make them your own, because each of us will find something different and compelling during our search for the center. <laughs>